Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you all this morning. And uh, welcome to Concord United Church. I'm Gord Dunbar, the minister here. And uh, mostly I would think that everybody who's on this invitation would know that just because you got an invitation. Um, we are glad to be with you, even though we know it's only electronically, but you can see that there are pictures attached to the pews from our photo directory so that at least I have some semblance of all of you being with your, or rather being here with me in spirit, if not in body. As well, uh, we have a lot of people to thank that make this happen every week, regardless of whether it's physically distanced or not. Uh, David Hamilton on the uh, leading us in music. Sarah McKenzie, who made the slideshow uh, pull together and, and look pretty. Uh, Jim and Judy Zerubic, who are up in the uh, tech booth in the balcony, making everything sound and look good. Dave Walker, who keeps the building clean and ready for us whenever uh, necessary. John Phillips and Liz Dillman, who take care of the money coming in and the expenses being paid going out. We use the screens a lot, and so whenever you see red print and bold, it is for the worship leader, in this case me, to read, and the black print and bold is for everyone to read together. So let's practice that as we acknowledge the land on which we are privileged to gather. For thousands of years, First Nations peoples have walked to this land. Their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and of their spirituality. We begin our worship this morning by acknowledging the unceded territory of the Saugeen Ojibwe. We are all treaty people, parties to Crown Treaty 45 and a half in 1836. Keep us mindful of the covenants that have been made and broken with First Nations people. May we grow into living with respect on this land walking into reconciliation through peace and friendship while honoring all who live, work, and worship on it. And there are a few announcements that I would like to bring to your attention. First of all, uh, you see this slide every week, but I think it's important. All recent services are recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel. If you're wondering how to get there, just search, go to YouTube through your search engine, and in the YouTube search engine, put in Kincardine United Church Ontario and ours will come up right away. You can click on the services you would like to watch or the parts of them. Uh, services continue to air a week later on Rogers C Cable Channel 6 and you can also view those services at the Rogers channel uh, um, website uh, rogers.ca. No cable TV is necessary for that. As well, fireside chats are posted every Tuesday from uh, my kitchen, recorded by Judy Zerubic. Uh, there's some humor, a reflection, some music, a prayer, and a blessing, all part of that. And hopefully uh, these uh, 20 minute or less uh, fireside chats can help you in your faith journey over time. We also remember very clearly and tragically Lebanon and Beirut and the harbor area in particular, uh, there was an interesting map uh, in the Toronto Star which showed that if that explosion had taken place uh, down on uh, uh, Queen's Quay in Toronto, that it would have leveled buildings all the way up to Eglinton. If we were to think of King Carden, it would take care of buildings from here halfway to Tiverton, and that is an enormous uh, radius of, of damage and destruction. So please keep the folks in Beirut, Lebanon in your heart and prayers. Um, one of the things that we do know is the United Church of Canada has not yet put anything together with our partners over in, uh, in Lebanon, uh, but I will let you know as soon as possible. Some people have been asking. I do know that because of the press releases that the Canadian government will match funds if we donate to, uh, as private citizens, if we donate to the particular charities that they list. And I know that those charities are listed on the, United, er, on the uh, Government of Canada website. As well, uh, whoop, let's go back one. Uh, ironically, 
the refugee family which fled Syria seven years ago and has been living in a refugee camp in Lebanon for the past six years has been given permission to come to Concordon in just weeks. So uh, if you wish to donate towards uh, uh, their coming, we do have money in the bank, but um, uh, we've got a house for them furnished and ready to go. We have a van for them that's been donated, uh, ready to go, and much other yet has to be done. But we expect them within weeks, and so if you would like to donate, feel free to do so by writing a check to Concordon United Church, and on the memo line, write down Refugee Family. Or you can do in all the ways that we donate to the ministry of this congregation. And finally, there's a birthday coming up on Wednesday this week, so it's for Randy Norris. Happy birthday, Randy. This Wednesday, August the 12th, you can make a physically distanced visit between 2 and 3.30 p.m. He'll be on his front porch to say hello, and so you can stand on his front lawn and, 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 and cajole him and tell really terrible puns, and, and, and I know he would love that. So, uh, happy birthday, Randy. As the church has done over the millennia, I greet you. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. And I'd invite you, no matter how awkward it might feel, to do so with those who are in the room with you watching this service. And as we prepare ourselves to acknowledge and praise the presence of God who is with us always, let us prepare ourselves for worship. Nothing worse than putting out the flame that you're supposed to light the Christ candle with. See, it's persistent. Even when it appears that the light of Christ has gone out, it has not. It persists and it inflames and enlivens our lives. It shows us the way to go and lightens the path on which we travel. Let's join together in the call to worship and prayer of approach that you'll find on your screens in front of you. The disciples were on the sea in the midst of a storm. They were frightened by the danger they faced. They wondered if anyone, even Jesus, knew their tribulations. Then Jesus cried out, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And they immediately felt calm and confident. There are days during this pandemic when we feel lost and alone. The challenges of life overtake us while each day's struggles overwhelm us. The demands are many, the burdens are great. Then Jesus cries out, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And we are immediately filled with calm and confidence and hope. We come in anticipation that the future brings hope out of uncertainty. There is so much that leaves us feeling helpless and alone. We come seeking the dawning of a new way, a way of peace and goodwill. Then Jesus cries out, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid and we work to create the immediacy of a realm of calm and confidence, of risking it all through faith. 
As we risk, let us seek communion with God in prayer. Daring God, here we are to celebrate your presence among us. Open our minds to possibility. Open our hearts to love freely. Open our hands to each other. Work through us, we pray. Amen. And let's join together in singing the first hymn, number 268 in Voices United, Bring Many Names. stormy seas. Waves of self-criticism, waves of despair, waves of shame, waves of brokenness. All these waves overwhelm us, sinking us into the depths. In our fear, we reach out for a savior. Some lifeguards might only pick the strongest, the closest to the surface, the easiest. The risen Christ knows what it is like from the inside out. Having lived amid such stormy seas with such overpowering waves breaking over him, with unconditional grace, with healing love, and with compassion, each of us and all of us are lifted from our peril, saved from ourselves and from our oppressive structures. 
The risen Christ risks everything for us without reservation. Thanks be to God. Breathing deeply of God's grace shared for each of us and for all of us, let us open our hearts and our souls to God in the intimate communion of silent prayer. Amen. So I don't know how many of you are good swimmers. It would seem like a, a, a really strange question to ask of people who live in the Concordan area, right next to the lake, with beautiful beaches that apparently over the last week have been terribly crowded and not very physically distanced. But nevertheless, I want to tell you a story. So here's a picture of the Lions Pool in Waterloo Park. I was born and raised in Waterloo. I only lived there for 45 years. But nevertheless, um, that little blue arrow is where I was trying to swim across the pool when I was five years old in a learn to swim class. Now, the pool that you're looking at, it, it, the, in the foreground, the pool water is only three feet deep. But on the far side, closest to the uh, what's called Silver Lake, although it's more like Silver Pond, uh, is five feet deep. So the water gets deeper the farther you go across the pool. And uh, I got over my head, and I was not a swimmer. I was trying to keep my head above water, except that I was below water. And I, I, I'm, I can remember looking through the clarity of the water up to my swim instructor, but I couldn't say anything except that I was shouting in my head, um, excuse me, but I'm drowning. Could you please come and get me? And then I got bumped into by somebody else in the class, also struggling to get across the pool. And that bump pushed me down to the bottom of the pool and from which I jumped up. And I came up out of the water, sputtering and gasping, and that's when the instructor found me, pulled me to the side of the pool, and I never went to swimming lessons again until I was 12. In fact, at the beaches, I never really went swimming at all, but I made great sandcastles. Now, the next picture is what they replaced that swimming pool with, I would have been a whole lot more comfortable with that over time. But nevertheless, the irony is that after I went back to swimming, at 12 years of age, I was in a learn to swim class with five-year-olds. Um, and even though I'm a short-statured person, I felt like a giant and I was very embarrassed. So I eventually became a lifeguard and swim instructor. And this is one of the things that I did. I, I, I wanted to test out the safety. No, go, go ahead, go ahead to the next slide. Yeah, the safety of this particular life jacket. Now, this is a vest style life jacket, and supposedly it's there to help you float at the surface of the water. But my thought was, well, if you are in a boat or you fall into the water, how is that gonna put you on your back? So I put one on, and in those days, I was much younger and far more fit. I could hold my breath for two and a half minutes. So I put it on, and I laid in the water face down in the deep end and waited to see how long it would take for it to flip me over on my back so I could breathe. Apparently, according to the other swimming instructors who were there with me, I was under for two minutes and 37 seconds before I came up gasping for air. So I tried the next life jacket. This is a keyhole life jacket. It is incredibly uncomfortable to wear. It looks goofy. And I thought, well, we're going to try it anyway because 
In my water safety training, it taught me that it was supposed to be the one that could turn us over on our back because all of the buoyancy material, the, majority, the bulk of it, is on your chest. So it would pull you over onto your back. So I tried it. And after 58 seconds, I was on my back and able to breathe. Now, I don't know about you, but 58 seconds is plenty of time to drown. So these life jackets, although the keyhole orange one is much, much better, they aren't going to save you if you're knocked out. You will drown. And the reality is that in the biblical reading that we're going to hear today, it talks about that very thing. What are we willing to risk in life? We're always looking for a rescuer. And yet, there are decisions we need to make for ourselves. So when we live a life of faith, we need to think about those decisions to consider their wider effects, not just for ourselves, but for everyone around us. Because you see, as a lifeguard, I also know that I won't save you if you're going to grab me. And we have procedures to protect me from you. However, as soon as you go limp in the water, I'll come and get you. So, a rescuer can't rescue you from your own folly. That's why Jesus teaches us to think about more than just ourselves but for all people around us and how we affect one another. In that teaching, it comes through the Lord's Prayer and the words of the Lord's Prayer. We're going to, to uh, uh, try a little different one today. It's not much different from the Lord's Prayer version with which we're familiar, but it's a little bit different. So let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, Mother, who is in the heavens, May you be made holy, may your dominion come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the bread we need, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And do not put us to the test, but rescue us from evil. For yours is the dominion and the power and the glory, forever. Amen. Notice that it's being rescued from evil not from drowning. Our first Bible reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 27. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat battered by the waves was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Let us sing God of the Bible or Fresh as the Morning, More Voices, number 28.
Our second reading today is from Matthew chapter 14, verses 28 to 33. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. together in prayer. Loving God, in the midst of this world, we seek an anchor, a place of refuge, a foundation upon which we can build. May your word and your will be that place of safety, of shelter, and of courage to dare to go forth. In Jesus' name. Amen. So from the picture you can see on the title slide that uh, very accurately seems to depict the story that Judy read from the uh, biblical passage for today. And, And this passage made me think about all the storms that this pandemic has wrought in our world. So here's a poem that uh, I pulled together in light of that. The weeks go by. The fourth, the fifth, the normalcies become a myth. I want to hug, I want to hold, I want this deadly scourge controlled. I want to walk amidst a crowd, I want to lift this morbid shroud. I sit sequestered in my home and yearn to mingle, travel, roam. My energy is out of whack. I want my normal problems back. Actually, we can go to black. One of the realities is the storms of life are not much different than the story that we heard in the biblical passage that was read from Matthew. You see, if you think about this one, this is after Jesus found out that John the Baptist had been beheaded by King Herod in order to satisfy a very attractive young woman in his court, a relative to whom he was infatu- with whom he was infatuated, John was Jesus' cousin and mentor, and he was grieving him deeply. And even as he tried to find isolation, he went off on his own, and then crowds followed him, and he fed all 5,000 men and all of their, their uh, partners and their children by giving them the miracle of sharing what they had, of recognizing the, the need for the greater whole. And after all of that, Jesus was exhausted. And as was his practice, he needed time to go away and to commune with God, to think, to ponder, to discern. Where was he to go next? What was he to do? How was he to proclaim the good news that he so carefully wanted to proclaim about the kingdom of God here and now? So he went off on his own while the disciples went to uh, the boat and went out on the sea. This wasn't unlike Jesus at all. There were lots of times that Jesus was off on his own and the disciples had to fend for themselves. Of course, with four of them being fisher folk, 
they certainly had access to boats that could travel the Galilean Sea. But you see, the Galilean Sea is surrounded on three sides by high mountains. And what it does is it funnels the wind into the one end, the eastern end of the Sea of Galilee. And even though it's a relatively small body of water, especially compared to Lake Huron, the waves can become enormous. And that's where the disciples found themselves. In the midst of stormy seas, and yes, they were sailors on that ship, uh, on that boat, and they were familiar with the kinds of storms that were able to blow up quickly. Usually they didn't happen at night, but here it was at the end of the day, and they were in trouble, and they were afraid, and they didn't know if this was going to be that one storm that overwhelmed them and flooded the boat and caused them to perish. And then they look out, and they see a figure walking across the water. They're looking for someone to save them. They're looking for rescue in the midst of all of the peril, the deadly peril that they find themselves in. And they see an image of Jesus, and they cry out. The reality is, this picture is very similar to those storms. This was a picture in the Toronto Star yesterday. This is one of the buildings facing the uh, harbor in Beirut, where 2,700 tons of the fertilizer blew up and caused a mushroom cloud registered as an over 3.2 Richter earthquake on the island of Crete. An amazing damage. You can see these look like offices. There isn't a whole lot left. And so the reality is that in the midst of that damage and destruction, there is enormous tragedy. I'd like to read you an excerpt from an article in the newspaper that talks about one family. Soha Sahaid had not seen her husband since Christmas. The coronavirus pandemic had kept her 44-year-old Jihad, that was his name, in Nigeria, where he worked for, for his family in Beirut. Once travel restrictions eased, he flew home with a new sense of urgency. You see, his six-year-old had been diagnosed with Hodgkin lymphoma. Together, Jihad and Soha spent 13 days with their daughter, Gemma, as she received treatment. We only had one more day left in the hospital, Soha said. When smoke billowed outside the hospital window Tuesday, the couple lamented Beirut's pollution and disorder. Soha began to film it in her phone, then went out to check with nurses if there was a reason to worry. As she opened the door, the world exploded. In an instant, she had to make a wrenching decision, focus on her daughter who suddenly was watching blood gush from her stunned father's head or leave the girl with others and try to save the life of the man she loved. Soha carried her burly husband down nine floors, walking barefoot on broken glass. The hospital was no longer functioning. She had to find another. Strangers appeared and helped her down the stairs. Her brother arrived to help. Soha reached a doctor friend on the phone who talked her through basic first aid. Jihado, answer me, won't you? She pleaded with her husband. But it was too late. Other hospitals, overwhelmed, turned the couple away. Soha's husband died in her arms. He never said a word. He didn't even open his eyes. I saw his soul leaving his body, Soha said. She only removed the broken glass from her feet three days later. She doesn't know how to ever remove the pain. I can't imagine 
a stormier occasion. I can't imagine what it is like for Soha to deal with the grief, the tragedy, in the midst of a society that has been destroyed. So much of it has not been helped by the 15-year civil war in the, in the last century, nor the sectarian strife within the government itself, all of it seemingly drawn across religious lines, making sure that each little group of faithful are given their piece of power where there is corruption and neglect. And as we now know, probably corruption and neglect was why that 2,700 tons of fertilizer was there to explode and to damage the main granary for the entire nation. In fact, in the pictures you can see the granary is virtually not there. Just one wall standing and all the grain spilled onto the ground, scorched and unusable. And then you, you think about what it's like in the midst of such a tragedy. How do they deal with that? And my mind goes back to the passage from Matthew. And, and there are the disciples in their boat, tossed and turned by waves, uncertain whether they will even survive this journey on the Sea of Galilee, both the place where they nourished their bodies and provided for their families by fishing, but also the place of many shipwrecks and lost souls. So when they see who they think is Jesus walking across the water, Peter calls out and says, Is that you, Lord? And Jesus says, It is I. Don't be afraid. And Peter says, If you call me, I'll come to you. And so he does. Jesus calls Peter, and Peter steps over the edge of the boat, over the gunwale, into the water, and starts walking towards Jesus. And then he sees the waves towering around him. He feels the spray of the waves crashing over him. He looks down at his feet, and he can't believe what he's doing, and that is when he starts to sink. And Jesus reaches out and captures him and pulls him to safety beside him. And he says, Oh, you of little faith, why did you not believe? Usually the interpretation of this particular passage is that if we just have faith, miracles will happen. The whole natural world will bow to our will. I would like to suggest a different interpretation. You see, Peter did have faith. Why else would he have stepped over the gunwale into the water to get to Jesus? It was only when he was in the midst of it all that he realized that maybe he'd been a little too daring and taken too big of a risk to even attempt to try that. And Jesus didn't say to him, Oh, you of little faith, because after all, Peter had enough faith to try and walk to Jesus. To me, this is an allegorical story about if we take the risk, we don't have to worry because Jesus will be there for us. Jesus wasn't saying, oh, you of little faith because you never believed enough to come to me. Why did you stop believing is what Jesus is asking. Why, when you knew that this was the way to go, did you not follow through? And for many of us, this is what makes us despair. We feel so overwhelmed, so out of it. Consider the poem that I gave to you at the beginning of this meditation. There are many times I feel overwhelmed, discouraged, depressed, just wanting to stay in bed and keep the covers pulled over my head. Ignore everything that's going on around me because I feel helpless. And then I hear Jesus speak to me and say, 
O oh, you of little faith, take my hand and let's walk together. You see, not all storms come to disrupt your life. Some come to clear the path. Let me, let me read that again. Not all storms come to disrupt your life. Some come to clear the path. You ever notice that after a storm, everything smells fresh and clean and new? That's what that particular saying is trying to get across. The path has been cleared by the storms of life, so we can see a little more clearly once all the clouds and the rain and the waves are gone and calm. It doesn't mean they won't come back. It just means that they have cleared a path for us to discern more clearly to where Jesus is calling us to walk with him. You think about the story I told from the newspaper about that poor mother who lost her husband and still has a daughter recovering from chemotherapy treatment. What is she going to do? What are the citizens of Beirut going to do? What are the citizens of Lebanon going to do? What are we going to do? You see, we might feel helpless. What can one person do, we might say to ourselves, in the midst of such an enormous tragedy? They're talking about the fact that this might take four to five billion dollars to fix. We've got a, a federal government who's saying, yeah, we're going to collect money and we'll match it dollar for dollar up to two million dollars, but we're not giving the money to the government of Lebanon because we know that it won't go to where it's needed. And here's a set list of all the charities we trust because they've been there many, many decades working with the people of Lebanon. It makes me think of the reality that one of my friends on the refugee committee here in Concordon is Eamon, Eamon Fada, and he has family in Lebanon. That's where he was born. And his heart clenched when he saw what was happening. And he reached out to his family, and luckily all of them are okay. But okay is relative, because we don't know how they will fare. And yet, what can one little person like us do? Well, apparently, just by sending an email to Eamon that I had him in my prayers meant something. Apparently, if we are willing to donate money to the charities that are trusted in Lebanon, things will happen. Apparently, when we welcome the family from who fled Syria's civil war and has been staying in Lebanon in a refugee camp for six years, when we welcome them to this community, we are making a difference. That's one less family that Lebanon has to take care of. After all, Lebanon has been overwhelmed by the influx of Syrian refugees. They are the country in the Middle East that has welcomed the most refugees per Lebanese citizen than any other country in the region. More than Turkey. More than Jordan. More than anyone. So what do we do? Well, let me remind you of the song that we sang earlier before the sermon. Not by your finger, not by your anger, will our world order change in a day. One little act at a time, one little step on the stormy seas of our society will make a difference. You see, it's not up to God to rescue us. It's up to God to walk with us as we rescue one another. The second half of the verse but by, no, Ed, we'll go back a slide, sorry. But by your people, fearless and faithful, 
small paper lanterns lighting the way. Small paper lanterns are based on the early Buddhist tradition during the Han Dynasty, 150 years before Jesus' time, that talked about the light within those paper lanterns symbolized the faithfulness of the monks going out into the world and shining the light of community for others. There's going to be a hymn that we sing near the end of this service. Will you come and follow me is the name of the hymn. And notice what it says. Will you love the you you hide if I but call your name? Jesus called out, Peter, come. And Peter came. And when he faltered, Jesus was there right beside him. So for us, will we quell the fear inside and never be the same, trusting that Jesus, the risen Christ, is there walking with us through it all, no matter what? In the storms of life, we can find the way supported by the risen Christ, enlivened by the light of the gospel, and knowing we are not alone, for we're all together as one. Thanks be to God. Amen. Make me, make me what you will. And so we do, hand in hand with the risen Christ, join together in prayer. Loving God, we look out on the horizon of our lives and we see so many waves storming towards us. Waves we would love to ignore, but still we cannot escape. Waves of care and concern for so many. If we look over there, we notice that there's a wave that's Karen Nanskaville in hospital with Jack and the family gathered around. And we walk over and reach out and hold them in our arms. We look to another direction and there are those who are living at Trillium Court 
in the aftermath of a single case of COVID-19. When we walk over to them with you at our side and reach out to hold them in our hearts. There in the distance, we see the people of Lebanon and particularly of Beirut. And we see the smoke and the fires, the damage and the waves of despair. And we walk through the spray of those waves and we reach out to them and hold their hands with you. And there, a little further away, we see the Syrian refugee family soon to arrive here in Kincardine, only to have 14 days of isolation before we can really engage them. And we walk over to them and we nod and we smile. We hold our arms out in welcome. Oh God, in the midst of these storms and overwhelmed by the waves, we offer our prayers of care and concern to you. Loving God, the waves have calmed, the clouds have scudded away, and your Son's light shines upon us. And in that light we raise to you thanksgiving. Thanks for the teachers and the educational assistants, the administrative staff, the custodial staff, and the school board members as they endeavor to plan a safer return to school this September. We thank you for the parents as they discern the safest options for their children and youth, wondering what's the best for when they return to school. We give thanks to you for the health care teams for their continuing work dealing with the p pandemic, but also their valiant attempts to catch up on the backlog of medical procedures, surgeries, testing, and imaging necessary to our continuing well-being. We give to you, O oh God, thanks for the helpers who call, keep in touch with friends and family, with neighbors and acquaintances, sustaining a web of care, one for each other. The light continues to shine as we give thanks for the frontline workers who continue to provide us with our most basic services while risking their own health for far too little compensation. We thank you for the businesses who creatively pivot to keep their businesses alive as they rehire workers previously laid off. For all these blessings, even in the midst of the former storm, we raise to you our thanksgiving. In the storms of life, O oh God, you are our shelter and our strength. We praise you as we offer ourselves for your mission of self-giving in the world. And we do it in Christ's name as we walk with him. Amen. There are many of you who have been faithfully donating to the mission and ministry of this family of faith, whether through pre-authorized remittance each month or by uh, e-transfers or by PayPal or a credit card or by Canada Helps. And we are so grateful for all of that. Many of you also just mail checks in and that is amazing what you have done and continue to do one for each other. So let us dedicate ourselves and our gifts to God as we pray. Receive these gifts that we offer back to you, loving God, as a symbol of all that we seek to be and to do in Jesus' way. Bless these gifts, directing us for their use in Christ's name, nurturing the well-being of 
all as we glorify you. Amen. Our closing hymn is, Will You Come and Follow Me? Voices United, number 567. As you were beckoned by Christ, go, as people gathered by the sender of love, upheld by the one who came in love, sent out in the power of love, go in peace. <laughs>